Leonardo da Vinci by Walter Isaacson. So I'm a huge fan, I think you probably know by now, of biographies. And so when I saw Walter Isaacson had a new one out on Leonardo da Vinci, I was pretty excited. It's a pretty cool time period. Uh, da Vinci was born in 1452, died 1519, which is smack dab right in the middle of the Renaissance. And about 100 years, a little over 100 years after the Black Death, and 161 years after the Crusades. So, kind of an interesting time. And the thing about biographies is if you do a biography on someone that is alive or died recently, you can go through all their correspondence, all their emails, get a pretty good idea of who they are just from that, but then you can go further. You can either interview the person if they're still alive or interview family, friends, and coworkers as Walter Isaacson has done with uh, the Jobs book, and he can get an even deeper understanding of who that person is and build a very good narrative off of that. That being said, the further you go back into time, the harder that is to do. So with Jobs, Walter Isaacson had a lot of material. He had plenty of sources. He could pull all of his information for that piece. When he went and did Benjamin Franklin's bi biography, Obviously, there's going to be less. There's nobody around that he could interview, but there is a lot of historical documents, and he was able to build a very good narrative off of his correspondence, his notes, and the, also the historical context, where he was at different dates and the significance of that. Benjamin Franklin, obviously, being a big person in history, was very well documented. But with da Vinci going all the way back to the 1400s, he relying on notes, documents, books written about him as a secondary source, to pull from which is actually probably not as good of a source so to write a biography on da vinci this this much after his death so centuries later you can rely only on the correspondence that survived the art he left behind and other books and whatever materials written about him and you can track there are records that walter isaacson was able to dig up and surprisingly there are quite a few and as far as biographies go walter isaacson is the go-to guy. He's an absolute favorite guy for biographies. Every one of his bios I've written and I've enjoyed every one of them. He has a way of taking all that data, arranging it in chrono chronological order. So for every piece Da Vinci did, he does a he does it chronologically through his life, where he was in a, at that point in his life when he painted, say, The Last Supper, who the patron was. And surprisingly, with The Last Supper, it is a shock that that painting has survived. First of all, it's not on a canvas, which I guess I wasn't really a huge Da Vinci fan before, so I didn't know it was in a, basically on a wall, like a, it was a fresco, to the point where someone knocked a hole through it for a doorway. It was used as a prison at one time, and it survived this whole time. People have thought about trying to remove it, which would completely destroy it. It's a, it's a big painting, but it survived. So Walter Isaacson has done an excellent job with the book because after it's done, you almost feel as though you kind of know him. So he goes through all of his his roots, where he comes from, the, the beginnings of his art, how it, you, you see it develop. Uh, if you have the audiobook version, there's a PDF that comes with it with all the different figures, photos, which I'm sure are part of the physical book. And on top of that, you really get a sense of what it was like to live in the 1400s, mid to late 14, or mid 1400s to early 1500s. And then when you finally get to the end and it's Da Vinci's time to die, you're kind of a little saddened to see him go. And also Walter Isaacson has a very good way of taking all the different myths that are associated with Da Vinci and as analyzing the facts. Like even his death, the way it was portrayed in paintings and everything else may not have happened exactly the way we are to believe that it happened. And so he presents the facts as they are and lets the reader decide what to believe. That being said, there are a few things about Da Vinci that really were, I think, surprising, probably led to his genius, his different methods. There were some that are a little quirky, like he did a lot of dissections. Um, I think that was pretty well known, um, just to see the different muscle groupings and everything else. And he's done plenty of sketches on all that. So if somebody, like, for example, was holding a baby, these muscles would be contracted from the weight 
and so his paintings were more realistic than those before him. And also he was a believer that things in nature don't have sharp lines. So he believed in blurring the lines to make it a little more believable, a little more realistic. And you can see the progression in his paintings through the figures on how that gets better. But my absolute favorite thing that he did as far as study was he would go around town and he would find somebody, just people that were just interesting looking. Not necessarily beautiful people, but interesting looking. So ugly people, people with exaggerated features, and he'd invite them over for dinner. And while they're at his house for dinner, he'd tell them just gut-busting jokes and watch the way and study the way their face would change, the muscles would pull and the smile, the edges of their mouth. And he'd incorporate that into his painting. He'd take exhaustive notes, which, by the way, about his notes, it's surprising that some of those notes have survived this long. I mean, who keeps around a grocery list for hundreds of years? But they did. He kept them on his paper. He just scribbled whatever on it. But anyway, back to what I was saying. He would study, study the way these people moved, the muscles along their face, and he would incorporate that. If it was an ugly person, he would incorporate that into his grotesque pictures, which... I actually prefer his drawings. I think his, his sketches are actually really cool. If you told me someone did it that you know it was modern done, I'd probably believe you. And I personally think his sketches almost don't look anything like his paintings. Like it could have been two different people. And that's another thing that I learned with Da Vinci. You always think I always picture him as that lone artist in the studio painting away uh, with some patron's portrait or whatever, kind of a lonely existence. But Walter Isaacson stresses here that this was a, this was a business for these guys. Da Vinci painted a lot of stuff, but he didn't necessarily paint absolutely everything. As a matter of fact, later in his life, he actually had a studio, much like the studio that he was an apprentice in, and he had all of his uh, different guys painting pictures that he would conceive and work on and tweak and make sure that it was the high quality that he wanted associated with his name, and that's how he was able to crank out a lot of product. That being said, he still wasn't able to paint everything that people wanted him to do. So, like, as a matter of fact, there's, like, one woman who was trying to find the perfect portrait of herself and kept trying to get Da Vinci, and he kept sidestepping her, never really telling her no, but would um, kind of keep her at arm's length just in case he needed to paint it, but really had no intention of uh, painting or anything. So, long story short, I really enjoyed this book. I really like Walter Isaacson's work and his uh, take on Da Vinci. Got a real sense of how Da Vinci was and also kind of a glimpse on what it was like to live in the 1400s, mid-Renaissance. So yeah, definitely a good read. Let me know what you think. If you guys have read it, if you agree or not, in the comments below and I'll talk to you next time.